What follows are extracts and excerpts from Chapter 4 of George Hillox Jr.'s book, Teaching Writing as Reflective Practice. This book was published in 1995. Chapter 4 is called Environments for Active Learning, a Vygotskyan Perspective. Environmental teaching creates environments to induce and support active learning of complex strategies that students are not capable of using on their own. Based on the assumption that teaching needn't wait, that learning precedes development, Vygotsky, 1978. Such teaching stands in sharp contrast to at least two other instructional modes. Presentational, where knowledge can be imparted, even complex strategy, and natural process, focused on freedom, choice, peer workshopping, and it's disconnected from traditional advice, structure, and formal models. The environmental mode shares process with natural process models, and yet it moves well beyond general processes to focus on what Smagorinsky and Smith, 1992, call task-specific knowledge, the processes entailed in particular writing tasks, and places greater responsibility on the teacher. Whereas presentational approaches focus almost exclusively on arrangement of form and coherence, environmental approaches provide environments that support students in learning strategies for developing both the content and the form of discourse. That is, processes, not just procedures. Environmental mode assumes with Vygotsky, 1978, that students may operate in tutorials, in teacher-led discussions, as long as they are true discussions, or in peer groups well above their normal levels when provided with support appropriate to their current understanding, as long as engagement is there. My synthesis of research on these three modes of teaching indicates that the presentational mode had the least impact natural process groups made considerably more progress, and environmental groups proved to have 2.3 times the effect of the natural process. Features of Environments for Active Learning In 1986, I described the environmental mode in operational terms as characterized by 1. Clear and specific objectives. For example, to increase the use of specific detail and figurative language. Two, materials and problems selected to engage students with each other and specifiable processes important to some particular aspect of writing. And three, activities such as small group problem-centered discussions conducive to high levels of peer interaction concerning specific tasks. Kellogg's 1986a, page 122. These three dimensions or characteristics of instruction identified the studies included in the category of environmental teaching. There are at least four important dimensions of this mode of teaching that lie buried in my description. First, not only are the task objectives clear to teachers, but they are operationally clear to students. Second, the materials and problems engage students because they have been selected in view of one, what students are able to do, two, the likelihood of their interest to the students, and three, their power to engage students as real-world problems. Third, students engage in complex tasks with support from materials, teachers, and or peers before they proceed to independent work with such tasks. Fourth, students develop a stake or sense of ownership in the classroom proceedings because their ideas and opinions become the focus of classroom activity. Let me examine each of these in greater detail. Goals and objectives. The approaches to teaching that seem to have found the most powerful effects on student writing, as revealed in the synthesis mentioned earlier, Hillox, 1986a, always had clear, specific objectives. Further, instructors appear to have made objectives operationally clear to students by modeling the procedures, coaching students through them in the early stages, or using specially designed activities to facilitate learning the new procedures. For example, in a series of studies, I have been focusing on a variety of approaches 
to teaching students to write extended analytic definitions. The extended definitions involve comparing and contrasting cases to develop a series of criteria that delimit some particular relatively abstract concepts. One sequence of activities intended to help students learn strategies necessary for defining complex concepts provide students with a series of scenarios involving courageous and seemingly courageous actions. They were developed on the basis of Aristotle's ideas of courage in the Nicomachean Ethics. In this activity, groups of three or four students were to examine each scenario, make a decision about whether the actor was or was not courageous, and write a rule or criteria for guiding decisions in other cases. Although students are quite able to make decisions about whether or not the actors in the scenarios are courageous, they do not use explicit criteria in presenting definitions, McGee, Bidlack, 1991, and have considerable difficulty in devising them. This situation suggests that the proposed activity will be in students' zone of proximal development. The objective of the activity is to help students formulate specific criteria for determining whether or not an action is courageous. The ultimate goal of this activity and others in the sequence is that students learn the process of formulating such criteria and apply it when they need to define abstract concepts. To make this objective operationally clear, teachers led discussions of one scenario and helped students develop a criterion by which they might be guided in future decision making. The scenario for this teacher-led discussion, originally developed by Elizabeth Kahn, puts Lois Lane dangling by her fingers from the edge of a 30-story building while Superman flies to her rescue. He grabs her just in time and carries her safely to the ground. The question for students is whether or not Superman or Lois Lane might be considered courageous. Student analysis and student discussion, as it stands at this point, applies only to the particular incident. Additional discussion is usually necessary to reformulate student ideas as a rule or criterion. The question becomes whether or not the idea applies to everyone or only to Superman. If it applies across the board, then how should the criterion be stated? Teachers leave the discussion until some rule emerges, perhaps one such as the following. An action cannot be considered courageous unless it involves serious danger or risk to the person performing it. The purpose of such discussion is to make the goal of the students' small group discussions operationally clear, to give them a more precise idea of what their task is in the small groups. Once the students begin working on additional problems in their small groups, the teachers circulate to various groups to determine from student talk whether they seem to understand the goal and, when necessary, to make suggestions and ask questions that will enhance the understanding of the goal. At the same time, the group activity is itself an aid to understanding the goal of the larger sequence of instruction, in this case, the writing of an extended definition. Selection of materials and problems. To promote successful peer group and independent work, the problems and the materials selected must be appropriate for the students, challenging yet within the realm of possibility when appropriate support is available within the zone of proximal development. If students can already do the tasks independently, ordinarily there's little point in having them do the tasks in groups. On the other hand, the tasks should not be so difficult that students cannot handle them at all. There is no algorithm that I know of for arriving at the appropriate level of complexity in developing such tasks. Teachers who listen to their students and observe what they can and cannot do in classroom discussions, in dealing with texts, in writing, and so forth, will have innumerable clues as to what may or may not be appropriate. However, making the initial judgment about appropriateness remains an art, but an art the results of which are subject to careful scrutiny. Anyone who tries new materials, including new textbooks, must introduce that new material with a fair degree of trepidation, eagerness to see how it works, and a willingness to scrap the new material and try something else. Any trial of new materials is a frame experiment. The materials and activities are selected for their power to engage students in dealing with problems of the kind we encounter outside textbooks, problems that are fuzzy, not so clear that only one solution is possible. Whenever a problem has a single solution, discussion, 
and probably learning ends when somebody finds the solution. When problems are real, they are amenable to a wide variety of solutions. With such problems, discussion and learning can continue indefinitely. Undoubtedly, there is a place in education for algorithmic problem solving, but small group discussion of the kind intended here is pretty clearly not it. Providing support for learning. Key to the success of this mode of instruction is that it engages students in the use of the complex processes to be learned. That engagement is made possible by providing a variety of supports at the outset and gradually withdrawing the supports as students appear to become more fluent in the use of the strategies. What I have called environmental teaching engages students in integrated whole language tasks that involve complex processes. Because the tasks undertaken are more complex than students can be expected to manage on their own, this kind of instruction uses two important kinds of supports to secure student engagement, what I will call structural support and small peer group support. By structural support, I mean the provision of aid or the restructuring of the task so as to reduce its complexity while retaining its essential features. For example, writing an extended definition of an abstract concept entails finding or inventing examples, comparing and contrasting them, devising criteria, and so forth. One of the most difficult parts of that task is devising the criteria. One way of simplifying that task without changing its essential features is to provide examples from which the criteria are to be developed. Providing the examples allows students to concentrate on devising criteria and implies the kinds of criteria to develop. Although some part of the task is taken over by the instructional environment, students must still use key strategies demanded by the task. As students become more adept at the task, the teacher withdraws part of the structure. That is, in later stages of teaching, students must undertake all phases of the task. In the case of definitions, for example, students must eventually invent their own examples as well as generate criteria and put all of that together into some sort of writing. Peer group discussion or collaborative talk, usually in small groups, is the second essential feature, perhaps the sine qua non of what I have called environmental teaching. Results of the synthesis of research on teaching writing, Hillox 1984-1986a, summarized in the appendix, strongly indicate that problem-centered peer group interaction, the major feature differentiating these collaborative small groups from others in the study is chiefly responsible for the gains made by the environmental groups. Any teacher who has ever used small groups as a standard part of classroom activity knows that the rate of active participation in small groups far exceeds that in teacher-led discussions. This is not an argument for eliminating teacher-led discussions. The introduction and follow-up to small group work may very profitably be teacher-led discussions. To ensure that small group discussions go smoothly, the teacher may circulate from group to group, listening in for a moment or two, perhaps asking a question to redirect attention, perhaps suggesting an example, coaching students as their discussions are in progress, but without taking over the central tasks of the discussion. Because the task is slightly beyond what students can do independently in the zone of proximal development, coaching must be readily available. Student ownership. The activities that drive environmental teaching are ordinarily planned or invented by teachers, but not all activities invented by teachers result in what I have called environmental teaching. Only activities that result in high levels of interaction among students in regard to the materials and problems qualify. When the levels of interaction are high and the interaction is among students rather than between teacher and students in recitation fashion, student ideas and opinions become the focus of attention and substantially control the direction of classroom talk. The teacher's role is to coach and prompt to ask questions that push at the edges of student ideas and to sustain the interchange among students. The goal of this work is always learning the strategies involved in the processes. The goal is not to find some correct solution to the problems at hand, a correct definition of courage, for example, if there were one. The problems are fuzzy and admit to a variety of solutions. The best days of group work that I have observed occur when groups derive conflicting solutions, report to the class as a whole, 
and begin to explore the reasons underlying the conflicts. The disagreements are the stuff of learning. This is what Graf, 1992a, has in mind when he talks about teaching the conflicts in theoretical perspectives. When students are encouraged to disagree and to defend their ideas reasonably, they develop a very meaningful stake in classroom proceedings. Making choices of topics and texts, however, is not essential to students having a stake in their own learning, as some theorists would have us believe. What is essential is structuring the learning environment so that students can gain entry to the ideas and the materials and can contribute to the groups and their own understanding of whatever is at issue. In a sense, this is what real teaching is about, helping students learn to enjoy the process of thinking through complex problems because that gives them the power and the confidence to undertake new problems in new situations without the structure of the classroom environment.